According to a study by Gallup, Americans' reaction to the term socialism is more negative than positive. What does it mean for candidates like Senator Bernie Sanders, who self-labels as a democratic socialist? At the same time, we're seeing a rise of a new generation of activists supporting the move toward a concept that was once a curiosity at best to most Americans. In his book, Why You Should Be a Socialist, Guardian contributor and editor at Current Affairs magazine, Nathan Robinson aims to explain 21st century socialism, and he joins us now to discuss the book. There it is, right yeah, there. The That's why right you. you should be a socialist. Nice pitch. Where can people buy it before you um, go? I think bookstores everywhere. Right, I bookstores. recorded the audio book, too, so go. they can listen Oh, to and you have a lovely voice, voice with a, a great, great accent. Voice. My yeah. hope is that it will be a great holiday gift for right-wing relatives. Yeah. Mm. That's the main aim of this book, because I think it's funny. How about neoliberal <laughs> As, relatives? Yeah. Every, I think that's even relative. better, honestly. Anyone who hates socialism, give them this well book. It's a little <laughs> so, on, Okay, so that's one motivation for yes. writing the book. What, what is the reason, though, you decided to put this into writing? Well, I, you know, I didn't call it why you are a socialist, so I didn't try and target a left audience, and I think a lot of left writing often targets left audiences. And I want to talk to people who are curious, skeptical. My original title was Socialism for People Who Are Extremely Skeptical of It. Hmm. That was very long. Yeah. So I, I wanted to write to talk. And I also, you know, it helped me think about, like, well, what are my ideals? How would I express them to someone who had no familiarity with them um, in a relatable way? And I, you know, I think about like trying to explain to my parents or trying to explain it to, you know, just some, someone I meet. So that, yeah. that was kind of the purpose of the book. Okay, so tell us what, what is socialism? Why should people be into it? Well, you know, I dislike that question, mm. right? Because the thing about socialism is that the entire the history of socialism <laughs> is, I mean, it's the logical first question. <laughs> the history of socialism is a history of people who call themselves socialists socialists arguing about what socialism That's true. means. And so, <laughs> so true. <laughs> one of the things I want to express in this book is that you you can't, the reason you can't, can't pin down a definition mm -hmm. is because socialists disagree. So how do you define it? What well, is the 21st century socialism well, you're advocating for? I tried to look at, so what do socialists have in common? What do the people who all use this label have in common? And one thing is that they have a deep sort of fundamental outrage at the idea of a, rule, a small ruling class and a large working class that don't really own anything. And I think they draw a lot of inspiration from Eugene Debs's philosophy, which is, while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. And you can hear echoes of that in Bernie's speech about how you need to fight for people um, in immigration detention centers, even if you are not an immigrant. Mm -hmm. It's that sense of solidarity. So s socialists are, the, the, mo the thing they're most united around is solidarity with people in the underclass. They look at the bottom of society and how people are treated at the bottom, and they judge a society by the difference between what it is and what it could be. And Deb seems to have deeply informed Sanders' views. He apparently, mm -hmm. before he was mayor of Burlington, when he was doing his odd jobs and his carpentry and whatever, yes. made a film about Deb. So you this can obviously listen has. To the album of Bernie Sanders narrating the life of Eugene Debs. <laughs> Which is, I haven't done, That's but I'm sure is amazing. Yeah. Um, but talk about is there an American tradition of socialism that, because I think sometimes, and Bernie falls into this as well, he talks about like Scandinavian countries. Yes. He's done that lesson in this campaign, yeah. but in 2016, that was very common. Um, yet there's a tradition here that you can fit socialism into. Well, this is what's incredible, right? People like, you know, argue about the USSR, but we have had socialism in the United States. In the early 1900s, there were a 1,000 Socialist Party elected officials around the country. There's a real flourishing of this movement, right? Eugene Debs got a million votes, um, and, and it was because it was a time of terrible inequality with a small ruling class and a large working class. Um, and the socialists, though, they got things done. You had socialist mayors, and they governed the city well. They were called sewer socialists because they wanted, you know, the sewer system to yeah. work, to which work. often didn't in places, right? They cared about the commons. They cared about public libraries and schools and these kinds of, of, of public institutions sure. that socialists are always trying to build. But see, that's that's where my qualm comes in, which is okay. that caring about public goods and caring about the underclass of society doesn't yeah. make you a socialist. It is, I mean, you know, there's a large capitalist yes. tradition of redistribution and all that that we've yeah. had here in the country. And yet, I mean, socialism to me is much more not just, you know, so-called solidarity with the public, mm -hmm. with the underclass and then advocating for public goods. It is a vision yeah. of the market orientation 
for the future. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay. I, I think that's yeah. where it really well, falls into trouble. I think, I think so yeah. there's, there's, there's one point, which is that a lot of people say they feel solidarity, sure. but then when it comes down to it and you look at the issues that they actually focus on, mm -hmm. it appears that in practice they don't actually really care very much. Yeah. And so, and I think socialists distinguish themselves by the, by the fact that they actually do focus on these things. These things occupy, they can't, um, there's a quote about how a socialist is a person who can't get over their outrage at the fact that most people who have lived have lived doing fruitless toil. Okay. Now, the market thing is is kind of a a myth because there's a mm. there's market socialism, right? There's an argument. One of the mm. intra-socialist arguments is between the market socialists and the non-market socialists, um, and and the reason you can have that is because the core of socialism is actually not so much about markets. It is about class. And one of the things that distinguishes socialism from progressive liberalism is this focus on do you have a small class of people who have far more power. Mm -hmm. So even if you have lots of regulation, you haven't really changed the power relations. And socialists often look inside the workplace and talk about like workplace democracy and how do you have democratic workplaces and the tyranny of the boss. Mm -hmm. And that you don't hear a lot in progressive circles, especially because a lot of rich liberals are landlords and sure. bosses. Well, and I think yeah. what you've just described in a way is the essential difference between Sanders and Warren. Yes. Right, because she cares about these issues. She cares mm -hmm. about working class people. She cares about a rigged system, et cetera. But when it comes down to it, her approach is to get together the brightest minds mm -hmm. and to figure out new regulation yeah. for markets to apply that hopefully will benefit the working class rather than, you know, when Sanders was mayor of Burlington, I looked at this this week, he formed neighborhood councils and he said, here's your budget. Yes. Working class, be like, do what's good for your neighborhood. It's a socialist approach to governance, which is participatory. My colleague Luke Savage talks about the West Wing view of politics, where you get the smart people and you get those people in the West Wing and you never to actually see the voters, right? You just need the smart people making the good policies, and right. she's got a plan for that. She'll take care of it. Just elect her. All the young her. Mayor Peets will be consolidated right? in that administration. And there is a danger to technocracy, yeah. but I also do think, I mean, so much of this seems to be this fetishization of this, you know, this worker-centric uh, worker-centric workplace at all times. And now, look, I'm not saying that workers yeah. don't need more power in their yeah. workplace, but can America maintain a dynamic economy that will be a global power in a social system? This is our same argument I've had with Bosker, and this is the same yeah. thing I'm posing to you, which is, to me, this system would doom the United States to a European-style state, which has absolutely no affairs in this, in, in, no say in the affairs of the world. And ultimately, that's what you're giving up here. Well, I mean, I, when you talk about systems, I, I mean, I tend not to talk about systems. We talk about socialism on a spectrum. And it's very clear that you could have many more socialistic policies and still have a thriving dynamic. Sure, but, but this is why but people again, like Bernie Sanders are what I'm talking about. Nordic, right? which this is, is it, I mean, why you should be a socialist is a declaration yeah. of a total erasure of the system that but not, we have not and overnight. of our status in the world. Yeah, but not, not overnight at all, yeah. right? I mean, this is, this is, we move towards more, a more and more socialistic society. Now, at a certain point, mm. perhaps, you know, the United States is very, very far from the point at which we're saying, well, that you're going too far, right? Yeah. Because we, first we need to get to the sort of Nordic social democracy, and then you can have <laughs> the argument that says we shouldn't go any further, yeah. we shouldn't have any more redistribution of power, we need to have... Um, a, a, we need to have tyrannical workplaces because uh, that creates incentives well, here's, for innovation. If I may, here's my dispute with that Go characterization, okay. yeah. which is that yeah. Help me out. it assumes <laughs> that working class people are inferior in terms of their exercise of power. Because if you're, if the whole idea is in empowering the working class, which in my view, if I was going to, that's the definition of a sort of democratic socialism, it assumes that these ruling elites know what they're doing and are more effective at wielding power than the working class could, should be. And I just think that's utter BS. I don't think that we've seen that in practice and in workplaces that have exercised more democracy, yeah. in many cases have been more successful than those that anoint, you know, these board members 
members who are part of the ruling class sure. and think that they know best. I, but that's I, my beef. No, with I, I totally agree. I think what it is, though, is that worker power. When I talked with Bosker Sankar, yeah, one right. of your counterparts, right? He says, yeah. worker power is the end in and of itself to be achieved at all costs. And my saying, what I would say is, is that that is a very foolish way as a way to lo run a global superpower. And so I'm not saying that the ruling elite well, necessarily knows okay. how to run the country better, but large structural systems are the way that the United States has maintained its independence for well, quite some time. the United States, yeah. there shouldn't be global superpowers. I mean, I, we're against, See, like socialists, this is, this is what we're, we're against. Right? I mean, you talk about yeah. how the United States can maintain yeah. its power. I mean, many of us are very skeptical of having the United States be a more powerful country that doesn't regard the interests of other of people in other countries as being worth protecting. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that you don't hear much discussion about foreign policy in the uh, in this election is because mm. people don't really care about the impact of America. I would yeah, I would disagree quite a bit with that. But we have to end it there, unfortunately. Nathan, is a the great The debate discussion. will continue, yeah. as they say, Nathan. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Congrats Thank you very on the much book. For Thank having you. me. Thanks. Of course. Of course. Well, well, more rising for you right after this.